we are recording the webinar. I'm just double checking. Yeah. And as you probably know, um, all the webinars that um, we have been um, uh, producing this year are uh, to be found at the Gießen website. If you just go to GießenCoffeeRoasters.eu, there's a button where you can uh, click on webinars and there you can review all the past years, this year's webinars. Um, just doing a check, Marcus, do we see a full screen Gießen webinar? Perfect, okay, good. So um, roasting business planning. I would say starting a coffee roasting business without a plan is like driving with your car east um, and not knowing where you go, just let yourself guide. That can be exciting if you start a roasting business without a plan, but it can set you up for um, failure. So planning your roasting business is of the essence of setting yourself up for success. The presentation that we specifically prepared for this webinar um, is also um, a program that you can follow, um, that you can subscribe to through the ongoing Boot Coffee Campus webinars. And we actually um, featured this program of today as part of a double session two times four hour, two times three, three to four hour um, uh, seminar, which helps you prepare in all these topics in depth. And so we're very delighted to have you uh, be part of um, today's um, session. And here you can see the topics of today. Some of these topics we will cover more in depth. Other topics we will, um, uh, not have the time to do so. And so uh, Marcus, I'm just going to ask my, my dear colleague, Marcus, Marcus, if you would have to pick any of these, these um, areas of business planning, in your assessments, are there any of these topics that are most important compared to some of the other business topics? Boy, I mean, I know that we're going to have to spend less time on some, so um, it's important from that aspect. But I think really your business planning should be comprehensive. It should take all of these things in mind um, it's, at some level or another. So it's really hard for me to say that, you know, one is less important than, than any of the others. Um, yeah, I think, I think we, I, they're all equally important. Yeah, I would say... You know, in the um, uh, planning, in the overall time planning of a business, if, if, if you look at the first topic, equipment selection, um, don't take decisions too quickly where it comes to equipment selection. Um, and I'm just going to ask um, our, uh, our guest, Rick. So Rick, before I'm going to put you on the spot here where it comes to equipment selection, can you maybe give us a little like a synopsis of your business business model and when did you start and maybe your background. Uh, we, we know Marcus and I know you quite well, but the audience might not know you that well yet. So could you give us a little bit of perspective? Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks William. So my name is Rick Appleton. Um, I'm the founder of Burwell Beans Coffee Roasters uh, based in Maui. Rick, can you speak a little bit louder? Oh yeah, sure. I'm Rick Appleton, I'm the founder of Burwell Beans, a small coffee roaster based on the North Shore of Massachusetts. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you because the sound we're getting is not great. Um, so maybe I'll give you a couple of minutes just to fix your sound. Maybe, maybe without headset might be better than after all. Um, and I'll get back to you in a second, Rick. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so, so equipment selection, as Rick will uh, very soon also explain from his perspective. Um, I often get the question from students, which roaster should I buy? Which roaster is the best? And, you know, of course, the answer is, is Gießen. 
but I don't want to just be uh, so foolish of making people without any judgment of allowing them to make that choice. I tell them, you know, here is a list with criteria that you need to um, evaluate in this uh, selection. And the criteria are technical criteria as well as uh, user interface criteria. And then I tell folks, I'm a, I'm a Gießen ambassador. There's a good likelihood with all these criteria that you'll end up with a Gießen as a result. Um, making a choice for a specific roaster brand based on, on hearsay or based on um, um, uh, purely subjective factors can be very dangerous. And here we have a um, lineup of some different roasting machines that the um, um, that Gießen makes on the on the upper corner you see a W1A uh, then under that you see a W15 with a loader and then you see a W30A this is these are just three models of the many um, models that Gießen manufactures and uh, Rick w which of these machines did you settle on when you selected your um, roasting machine I actually selected the W15A um, and I also purchased the loader um, only because I had a ceiling height issue in the roastery that I moved into and I also bought the de-stoner um, so I have the geese and de-stoner too. So, so you have the, the whole package? The whole like, package. Looks very yeah. nice. Cool. From the moment of um, knowing that you were going to start a roasting business to the point that you had made your choice for the equipment. But how much time did you take for the equipment selection? I took about uh, six months. Um, wow. I evaluated, I think, five different roasting machines. I had the, the benefit of actually being trained at Boot Coffee on a geese. And so I really like the, the controls around the, the, the geese and offers and also the aesthetics. It's got that sort of antique style aesthetic but it's also you know very very well built and it's very modern um i evaluated them all both from a you know price perspective um, performance perspective um, location of you know where i could get support and being on the east coast it was great that you had the you know geese and um, support unit in in pennsylvania so i actually ended up on the geese and too so. And I'm very, very happy with it. Very, very happy. And, and so it sounds like you looked at other uh, machine options, other uh, brands as well. Um, and did you take the time also to test roast on some other machines before roasted, you did that on the Gießen? I roasted on another, another one. I flew out um, and roasted on, on a, a, a different machine. But I actually went down to Pennsylvania and re-roasted on the W15-2. Um, you know, I think it was more, you know, if I had to pick one thing that, that um, you know, tipped me to go towards the geese and was the, the locality of the support unit. And yep. you know, having that benefit of the training on the machine too. So, you know, there's a lot to learn when you buy a roaster machine and, you know, each one has its own little funky quirks, et cetera. So um, cool. I, I really like it. And, and Rick, what is your background originally what what work did you do what what is your profession originally and so i've i've spent a lifetime career as a, a senior executive in the biotech and pharmaceutical industry and the beginning of last year i found myself in a position where i could you know do something else i'm a big uh, jazz fan i'm a musician i play the saxophone and my ultimate dream was to open up a jazz club and I did a business plan for the jazz club um, probably 12 years ago now and I thought you know this is the time where I can um, dust that off and redo it so I was working on that business plan and I've always been into specialty coffee myself and you know as a consumer and I started exploring roasting at home just as a hobby for my own consumption and it was really the more I learned about that, the more I flipped my business plan into I'm going to do coffee roasting and then down the road, I'm going to do a jazz cafe themed coffee shop. Yep. 
That's, what That's I mean. very cool. So, so thank you for that perspective. I always love to hear the background of um, our clients and how they get into coffee ultimately. Um, so if we talk about a machine choice, then I think a very important starting point is uh, understanding what that machine adds to uh, your production capacity and also on uh, how it influences your, your cost of goods sold. And here you can see with the different um, uh, machines that Gießen makes for the smaller companies, you can see here the W1A, that's the one and a half kilo um, model, the six, W6A, the W15A and the W30A. And you can see the roasted coffee volume that each of these machines can produce uh, on a per pound, uh, per batch basis. Um, and then you can see the realistic roasted volume per hour, which we say here is three batches. Why is it three batches? Why not four? Because if I'm literally, if I'm roasting on my W6A here in the campus, then I can easily do four batches once I'm roasting. But you shouldn't forget about the fact that uh, you need to clean your machine you need to inspect it before you start roasting. You need to cool it down. You need to preheat it before your roasting session. You need to cool it down. And so effectively on an eight hour uh, session, you might be able to do not more than 24 batches, three batches per hour. Um, and that translates in a certain uh, per hour, um, per eight hour capacity and an approximate cost. And here you can see the actual cost plus some other um, estimated charges that might go into um, uh, transport, uh, getting your machine into place, doing some um, relatively simple build out with your exhaust system. And so you can see that like um, a uh, W6A, which, which will run you uh, equipment wise less than $30,000, it will easily cost you $30,000 or more once it's in place. And it's important to, to incorporate that. And then when you're looking at, um, and Willem, I just, yeah, Marcus, just, just interrupt if you can go back that just one slide yeah. is what I do think is important. You know, these, these are ballpark costs, as you said, but you know, I think it's really powerful to realize that, you know, stepping from a six kilo roaster to a 15 kilo roaster, right. You're only adding, 10,000 US to the cost, but you're, you know, more than doubling, you're two and a half times the capacity. Um, so boy, for kind of an efficiency standpoint, and when you think about the labor hours and all that an entrepreneur like Rick can be doing in addition to standing in front of his roaster, um, that's to me where the kind of interesting value comes in, you know, the just to buy the roaster is a significant investment, but then to scale it to an appropriate size, um, not so much. Yeah, and if I may add to that, also, once you start upsizing your machine, let's say you go from a six to a 15 and then a 30, then the, the whole realm of the type of business you're running will change as well as with that, um, the equipment often required to um, clean your roasting exhausts and your smoke and your odors uh, will change. And the, um, equipment, the packaging equipment, everything sort of yeah. scales with it, of course. So it's it's not quite so simple, but exactly. And, and and Rick, I'm going to ask you for some more perspective in a second on this as well. So approximate weekly volumes for the type of business that you're running. If you're running a cafe or bakery or a restaurant or an office or a grocery store, then um, these are the types of weekly volumes you can see. But obviously, when you're uh, installing a roaster, then very quickly that roasting machine will not only become um, the machine to, to produce your roasted coffee for that cafe or bakery, because you will very quickly get into a wholesale and that volume will gradually and quickly increase as well. And then, and then with that, we have other additional equipment like Rick uh, mentioned he has a loader and a destoner. 
Plus, you will have to evaluate other mach uh, machine options, the accessory machine options. Um, you will have to think of uh, green and roasted bins, software. Gieson has an awesome software program since the uh, update was made quite recently. It's even better. Um, and then there is the facility cost and the preparation of your facility where it comes to the ventilation, both inside the roaster warehouse, as well as your exhaust system going outside, your electrics, your plumbing, your gas. Now, I want to warn you here, this, this requires, all requires planning. You might find a beautiful warehouse that has a great location, um, but, and you might want to install your roasting machine there, but why don't you first check whether or not that warehouse has the right electrical infrastructure or whether the gas lines coming from the streets have the right pressure, the right layout, because sometimes it might cost you many, many dollars to uh, update uh, such a system. And that yeah, can be very mine, tricky. Yeah, a buddy of mine opened a roaster in a beautiful old building that was like four stories high. The roaster was in the middle of the cafe. <laughs> And you know, punching exhaust through four stories of an office building and disrupting all of your neighbors' lives while you do that, and spending the cost of a nice Mercedes to install that ventilation network was was serious. Yep. Um, and then here you, you can see an overview of all the other equipment that should be considered. Um, Rick, can you give us a little bit of perspective? It took you. Um, six months for equipment selection i assume in those six months of planning you also looked at uh, some of the um, aspects that we outlined like the venting system and all of that C can you give us a little bit of perspective yeah i was actually really fortunate because i spent my whole career overseeing design and construction of like millions of square feet of buildings so that side of you know um, the real estate side, you know, very very comfortable with. I think it took me probably three months, um, you know, searching for space, looking at spaces, and I really wanted a single level building, um, you know, single tenancy um, that I could actually do fit out myself. I found the space I'm in. Um, you know, it's really good. It had a low ceiling height, so that's why I opted for the D Stoner too. You know, I had to do structural assessment. I had to get all of the, the ventilation requirements uh, designed and installed. Electrical I had to boost some electrical infrastructure. I've got separate storage in the same building, but that's in a separate area that I can control um, environmentally too. So, I I did take the time on that. Um, you know, and I, I, I'd worked with um, many sort of general contractors before. So, you know, I, I went through that process of selecting them and they really wanted to understand, you know, the, the, the requirements I needed from the roastery. You know, my, my design, I actually sort of just sketched it out myself because, you know, I, I figured out my workflows that I wanted and it's worked out pretty well. It's not, you know, a true blueprint, it, you know, if it was in different space, it, it would be slightly different, but it, it definitely works for me. And the installation was, you know, really good fun. Um, you know, I had a great team from Gieson come in and, uh, you know, commission it and uh, do some and, testing. And, and that was the team from, with David and Katie, they're based yeah. in Pennsylvania, they're the Gieson representative for North America, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Cool. You know, and that was in the beginning of uh, COVID as well, so it was pretty challenging. I had delays getting the you know the the equipment imported, um, you know, and getting scheduling them to come up in in when COVID was really getting bad, you know, in the early part of the the uh, yeah. late early spring. But it all went very very smoothly, and then I spent you know probably three months before I opened, really getting to know the roasting machine and working out my profiles, um, you know, drinking lots of coffee myself, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, it, it was fun. I, I really enjoyed that part. Cool. Yeah. Needless to say, planning is really key. 
specifically where, as Rick mentioned, um, making sure that the install and the startup of your machine is fun rather than that it becomes your first uh, business nightmare. We have had uh, various clients come here to Boot Coffee Campus and basically, you know, get their uh, hands dirty, roasting coffee, testing the Gießen, understanding um, how it works, also understanding the uh, installation requirements. So, uh, and we have had various clients do this. One of them is Aaron from Aaron Coffee. There's a column we wrote about him recently. And he took the time to uh, test roasts and also to understand all the uh, installation requirements. So when it was actually time for him to do that, it was like doing an exercise he had done already many times uh, before. Yeah, I think another um, investment in just having coffee available to practice with, to learn with. Yeah, um, and, that, and that brings us into the green coffee chapter. And Marcus, I'd, I'd like you to... Um, um, take this um, part of the session. And um, obviously starting a coffee business and making the right choices for your green coffee, that those go hands in hands. And Marcus, you just give me the cue when we can go to the next slide. So yeah. let's talk about suppliers, samples and assessment. Yeah, of course. I think, um, you know, the, the green coffee in a lot of ways, this is the soul of, uh, of any roasting business is the coffee selection. And, um, and it's so important to kind of understand how this market works, how your relationship with suppliers work, and to make sure that you're sampling and assessing your coffees in an appropriate way. Um, you know, I think, go ahead to the next slide, Willem. That, you know, first of all is, you know, you have to understand the market. You know, even specialty roasters are buying coffee that in some ways is tied to the C market. So as part of your training, as part of your education, as part of your planning of your business, um, you know, start watching this market and understand that when you look at offer sheets from importers, you will see like fixed pricing, which is just a set price for that coffee. Or sometimes you'll see pricing like on the left, this differential pricing, which will be some dollar amount on top of a reference to the New York Board of Trade coffee C market. Um, which just means you're going to pay whatever the market is on the day you sign a contract, plus a little bit more. So next slide. And then also understanding that you have different models for purchasing coffee with importers. You know, I think most roasters, when you start out, and most importers, when they start working with a roaster, you're working from a spot buying model. And spot coffee is just coffee that's available for purchase in a specific warehouse for a delivery whenever you sign that contract. So it's very simple. It's like transactional, like we're used to with buying so many things. Whereas forward buying is a little bit more complicated, but that's when you as a roaster would sign a contract to purchase coffee that isn't yet available, right? This is an example where, you know, maybe you have a coffee Rick's drinking in Guatemala. I'll just use that example. You buy a great coffee from Finca El Valle in Guatemala and you love this coffee, and you bought that spot, but boy, then the next year you get a call from your importer and they say, hey, you know what? This coffee is coming available. I know you did well with it last year. Can we get you on contract so you have guaranteed access to this coffee? So another really important model. Um, and you know, with all of these, if you're working with an importer, you know, what's really important to think about is where is that importer storing coffee? Right, so somebody like Rick, who's based on the East Coast, you know, he could very easily contact an importer here on the West Coast um, so, or in the Midwest, somebody like Troboka um, or somebody like Royal Coffee in Oakland, because these companies have an interest in storing coffee near you. So you don't have to feel like you're tied only to importers in your geographic area. The important question to ask is where is your coffee located? You know, Rick wouldn't want to buy coffee from an Oakland, California warehouse. It would cost him as much to transport it to his facility as it would to um, to move it, or as it, as it would just to buy it in the first place. Actually, you'll be surprised. It's not that bad because <laughs> yeah. I've, I've actually done it. <laughs> yeah, and if and if especially if they're um, 
if they're moving other coffees across the country, right? Like you might be the impetus that the importer says, yeah, you know what, we should move some more inventory over there, then you benefit from that economy of scale. Um, but I think, you know, that, that's, you know, find people that you like to work with and then you can figure out how to get the coffee near you. Um, and next slide, Willem. And of course, all of this should start with samples, right? You need to taste the coffee before you purchase it. Most importers are gonna send you green coffee samples. Um, recently, there's been some importers that are also roasting samples for you um, so that you can taste them. And you know, and that sample analysis really should start by looking at the color, the size of the beans, smelling the coffee. You know, it should smell green and vibrant and fresh as opposed to dry and hay and woody. The bean size should be somewhat consistent so that it'll roast consistently. Um, contracts also have very detailed specifications about um, sample size so and um, the size of the beans. So go ahead to the next one. And of course, also as soon as you receive a sample, it's important to take a look at it and make sure that you know the moisture, the density, perform a green grading. These are objective measurements of that coffee. But you might be tasting a sample and the coffee won't arrive to your warehouse for several months. Well, you want to have this uh, these objective measurements, not just to tell you how you might approach it in a roaster, but you want these objective measurements so that you can make sure that once the coffee arrives in your warehouse, you're receiving the same coffee that you initially tasted. Next, Willem. And you know, there's a lot of resources to help you understand the, the green grading of coffee. This is a poster that Sustainable Harvest Importers produced. Of course, the SCA Green Coffee Handbook is the Bible of this kind of work um, that goes through in quite detail each of the physical defects, the possible causes, the impact that they'll have on the cup. Next slide, Willem. And these defects are ultimately categorized as category one or quite serious defects, category two, still important to note, but less severe in the cup. And so once you've sort of taken a 350 gram sample of coffee, pulled out all of the defective beans, according to this list in the photos, go ahead, Willem. You can use a, um, a worksheet to sort of log your results, keep it on file, communicate that back to your suppliers, and then make sure when the actual arrival of the coffee occurs, you go through the same exercise and make sure that it's within a, the, the same standard as what you, what you purchased. So a really important look at the coffee. And of course, the other piece is um, tasting it. It's the sensory evaluation. So next slide, Willem. And so, you know, we have these standards and these protocols that allow buyers and, you know, producers or your importer to communicate about the quality of the coffee that you're purchasing. You know, kind of in a traditional world, sample roasting was not about profiling. It wasn't about designing a great flavor. What it really was about was looking at a window into that coffee to see what its potential is. So next slide, Willem. And so we have a very specific protocol for sample roasting, which is eight to 12 minutes. It's kind of a light to medium roast. It's SCA roast color tile 65 whole bean coffee. And that roast shall have completed first crack. Um, you know, and a tool like the Gieson WPG is a really powerful sample roasting tool. Um, in the past, sample roasters were really kind of one trick ponies that just let you roast a sample to these standards, but not much more. But with like this roaster where you have the full complement of geese and controls, um, you have multiple um, thermocouples inside, you really can also use these machines as small lab machines and profiling machines. Next slide. And now, you know, this, this kind of a chart gives you a picture of why we have this specific protocol, because that green box surrounded by pink kind of shows you where we're targeting with the sample roast. It's where the enzymatic flavors or those acid driven flavors are at a peak. It's where the sugar browning or like the caramelization and Maillard reaction flavors are also nearing their peak. But before you get into the kind of roasty carbon driven flavors of darker or longer roasts. So it's just this perfect window into the coffee, which when you combine that with the cupping protocol, next Willem, you've got a standard that we can follow whether you're Rick roasting coffee in Massachusetts, 
whether I'm roasting coffee at my lab in the Bay Area of California, or if you're um, roasting, or if your producer is roasting coffee in Panama, you're all roasting and tasting the coffee in the same way. And these are very detailed examples of how to perform these protocols with five cups so that you can check for uniformity. You're going through all of the steps with water quality and things. So let's move on, Willem. Before we move on, um, Rick, how, how have you been going about the um, aspect of green coffee purchasing? And how did you start off in that uh, part of your business? So I actually worked with an importer on the East Coast initially for my first um, beans that I purchased um, for my sort of development roasts and uh, commissioning roasts. I actually just used up some green samples that I had from home because I was sample roasting on the car um, before I actually set my business up. But I actually worked with an importer, selected the beans I wanted, um, received the samples as Marcus you know, detailed sample roasted them, purchased them. But since then I've been purchasing um, from a few different importers. And I've also been talking direct to uh, two farms that are also exporting and you know, they take care of the importing too, so. And, and, and how did you um, actually make a choice for a specific uh, green coffee origins, knowing that you, know, you started a new business? So how do you know what your customers were looking for? I actually had really good training from Marcus in Boot Coffee. <laughs> wow. And I, we, we, your check is in the not, mail, Rick. Your check is in the mail. Thank you. <laughs> we, we did not bribe Rick in any way, okay? No, no, I think, just, I think what it was, I, you know, I, I did a lot of research myself and part of my business, I wanted to offer coffee from all of the, the major growing regions. So I looked at the, you know, the harvest calendar. I worked with the importer to understand. I really sort of set my strategy of, you know, being able to offer, you know, light, medium, dark, um, some blends, some espresso blends, and then really what beans are the best to sort of complement each other for that whole spectrum. So I didn't just sort of look at a catalog type of thing and order beans. I you know, I, I, I received samples, I, I looked at the potential of each of those beans and what I could do with it. Uh, did a lot of research and studying on, on blending, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, how I can actually sustain that um, from a harvest calendar perspective too. Great. Yeah, thank so you. I, I will um, move forward. We, um, Time moves so fast with these fun topics. Um, th there's a there's this key element that um, uh, Marcus was going to focus on, but I'm going to focus on at this stage. You know, share the cupping results with your coffee supplier. Um, there's nothing as frustrating for a coffee supplier and never hear back about the quality profile of your coffee. I can speak a little bit. Um, from that perspective because I'm a, I, I, I run a farm in Panama and um, some, uh, a couple of months ago, I sent a whole package uh, of samples to a prospective buyer um, in Asia. And, and I asked the buyer, you know, hey, will you please make sure that you give me some feedback? And it took me a long time to actually get that feedback. And that's really important. So if you're providing your prospective importer, uh, feedback on the cupping results and they will also know that you are someone who takes uh, your business seriously and um, that is really key and when we're getting into the realm of your green coffee buying strategies now you're getting into an area where various business aspects are very relevant and um the bottom line here is, you know, what is your roasting, what is your strategy overall? What is your business strategy? Um, because the choice for your green coffee is going to have consequences on what quality types you want to feature. It will determine what um, price points of the roasted coffees you're going to uh, be able to hit. Because if you're buying... Um, 
uh, $5 per pound green coffee beans and you're going to operate a wholesale business where price can be very competitive, then that can be a challenge. So you have to incorporate it, that into your business model. You will have to look at the seasonality and the availability of coffees. So buying, for example, a coffee from Panama in uh, the months of December can be a challenge because that's when Panama usually starts its harvest. And so you might be buying at that point coffees that are uh, a bit on the older side. Um, the aspect of certifications and in relation to certifications, you know, what kind of sustainability model does this coffee represent? Um, so there are a ton of factors that you need to uh, take into um, consideration. And Marcus mentioned before, you know, the warehouse where this coffee is coming from, where is it located? Um, and that is obviously a, uh, an aspect that needs to be um, take, taken into this equation. And then the, the buying strategy has to be a function of what type of um, role this coffee component is going to play in the product portfolio. Um, a blender, meaning you know, a coffee that is going to be part of a, um, uh, a house blend or similar, um, the requirements for a blender can be very different for a single origin coffee. Single origin coffees have to be standalone. They have to prove themselves on the shelves, in the cup, and even more so for a, um, yeah, a rare coffee offering, like a boutique type of offering. Here you see a, um, um, in a photo of a Gesher Village coffee, which is a farm that um, we are actually partners in. And we are very, very familiar with these types of business models, whether it is blender, single origins of, or boutique or limited coffees. So, so those choices will those choices will have very distinct consequences for how your marketing model will have to be um, uh, designed accordingly. When we are looking at um, your green coffee inventory, you know the inventory of your green coffee beans in your warehouse is like having money sitting in the bank. However, there's a difference here the green coffee doesn't get any better while time matures and money sitting in the bank can actually give you interest so it's actually um it can be a major cash flow burden if you don't plan this well um, here are some examples of um, coffees that could be part of a coffee portfolio um, a, a katura katura is a variety from panama um, or a Yirga Chefe washed from Ethiopia, or a Brazil pulp natural that can be a great component in a um, espresso blend, or a Sumatra Tiga Raja, um, or a Swiss water decaf. Don't forget your decafs because it's ultimately 15% of what consumers want. And so these are all approaches on how you can um, establish in a green coffee inventory when you want to keep your um, choices for your different origins somewhat limited. Um, Marcus, would you like to talk with our friends around the world about cost of goods? Yeah, of course. And I think, you know, it segues nicely from that discussion of buying strategies, because when you think about like your blenders, hopefully you're hitting some sort of a weighted average cost of goods for that product. Same with your single origins. Um, but yeah, cost of goods, a lot goes into this because you have to account for the coffee cost, of course, the shrinkage, the labor to roast that coffee, you know, perhaps the way that you are depreciating your equipment over time and all kinds of other considerations like your energy costs and things. So next slide, Willem. You know, we, we already saw this and I just wanted to put this slide up again to kind of have you take a look at the volume of coffee you're able to produce in an eight hour day and planning for the growth of your business. You know, like if you're just starting out, 600 pounds of coffee might sound like a whole lot of coffee in a day. But if we think about those volumes and a cafe that's maybe using 100 pounds or 200 pounds of coffee in a week, 
Well, you get a handful of wholesale accounts and before you know it, you know, you're spending a lot of time at the roaster. So go ahead, Willem. So, you know, some of the uh, assumptions that you need to make, some of the inputs to calculate your cost of goods would be thinking about what is your target for the number of roasted pounds of coffee you're going to need to produce every week. What is the capacity per batch of your roasting machine? How are you accounting for delivery time or shipping costs? I think right now I see a lot of our clients sort of scrambling to figure this out because um, coffee consumption has moved out of cafes into homes. So there's a lot more mail order coffee now and that can, can add a lot per pound if you're providing shipping. Of course, energy use, the value of your roaster and other equipment. Go ahead, Willem. And of course, knowing your green coffee, right? It's not just the cost per pound that you're invoiced from your importer, but it's what are all of the associated costs, the carrying costs, if that's in a warehouse, the trucking company that you're paying to deliver that coffee to your facility, um, any money that you're tying up in that coffee. And then when you get into the roaster also, you know, what is your average weight loss from roasting? You know, it's probably average somewhere between 14 and 20% or 22% if you're roasting very dark. But don't forget the coffee that's going into the lab, the coffee that you're giving out as sales samples, the coffee that you're taking home. And then we also, of course, have all these other costs, the bags and the labels. Um, I once started a roasting company and a designer was asking me to produce bags. And when I, um, he came up with beautiful designs, but when I would start my stopwatch and make these bags, it would take um, like a minute to produce each bag or two minutes to produce each bag. So that labor cost was very real. So we had to simplify it. Next, Willem. And, you know, just to give you a sense of, of, again, thinking about additional equipment that you might invest in, if you're filling bags by hand, like grocery size bags, if you're doing three or four bags per minute, you're doing pretty well. Whereas one of these weigh and fill machines can, you know, be five times more efficient. But you need to be able to justify that. So go ahead, Willem. And then, you know, if we start looking at a couple of examples of how all of this works out um, in practice, we just took an example of a roasting company that's, that's you know, roasting about 500 pounds of green coffee each week. Um, and, you know, we took different prices for the landed cost of that green coffee, that three, four, four fifty, five dollars $5 in your own warehouse. When we look at that weight loss, you know, that 500 pounds of green is a little bit less than 400 pounds of roasted, which means our $4 a pound coffee is now $5.07. And to do 500 pounds of coffee on a one and a half kilo roaster, this is an example for a one, one and a half kilo Gieson, you know, that's um, 83 hours a week. So suddenly that's a complicated proposition. Um, because that labor, if somebody's earning $35 an hour, that's with all of your business taxes and things, you know, that $4 a pound coffee, suddenly your cost of goods before it's in a bag is $11.30. So let's look at the next, the next slide, Willem. And here you can see we've now decided to invest 10,000 additional US dollars and upgrade to a six kilo roaster. Of course, there's additional costs. Um, but in this case now, you know, our labor is only 20 hours per week. So that frees my entrepreneur up to be selling more coffee, to be managing the business, and our cost per pound of sellable beans um, comes out to $6.10 a pound. And now let's look at an example where we are with Rick, where he has a 15 kilo roaster. And you can see as we go through all of this now, it's just like one roast day per week, you know, about an eight hour day. The all-in cost for that $4 a pound coffee is about $5 per pound. And suddenly when I start thinking about my margins and maybe wholesale prices of $10 to $12 a pound for a nice coffee, um, you know, I've got a business model that starts seeming sustainable if I can hit that target volume and grow it. So, so Rick, did you do an assessment like this before you decided to buy the W15A? Yes, I did. I, I had a, a detailed spreadsheet that went through all of those inputs as well. Um, 
you know, even though I got the W15A, one of the reasons I, I you know, liked that machine as well, um, you know, you don't have to roast the, you know, the 15 kilo, you can actually roast as low as three or four pounds and still get realistic results from the probe. So, you know, even though my cost of goods aren't that at the moment, because, you know, I, I actually chose a business model where I roast to order, so I don't bulk roast and hold inventory. I, I tend to roast to order. Um, you know, my, my intent was to roast three days a week, um, but I'm, you know, realistically I'm roasting four or five days a week now. So, you know, my, my cost of goods, um, you know, is, is pretty well understood, but, you know, the efficiency um, will need improvement, but that, that will naturally um, get improved when, when the volume goes up. Cool, yep. So, so it's kind of a trade-off between the number of hours you are projecting ultimately to spend behind your roaster versus the size of the roasting machine versus the investment in your machine, right? Exactly. I, you know, I liked that level of investment um, because, you know, I'm not going to buy a, a smaller roaster and then find myself in a couple of years, you know, undersized. I wanted that expansion capacity, but, you know, the W15 also offered that you can do smaller batches, you know, pretty accurately too, uh, produce some really good coffees. So it worked for me. Um, you know, the, in hindsight, I think, you know, sample roasting, um, you know, I had the Akawa, but transferring, you know, sample roast profiles to the bigger machines is, is you know, it's, it's a very manual process because you, you just got to figure it out yourself. But I think if, you know, down the road, um, you know, I might buy a smaller machine just to do more development roasts and profile development. Yep. So, <laughs> by the way, um, I posted it through the chat. There are five, 15 optional topics that we came up with that could be part of future Gießen webinars. If you could just, the audience, if you could just indicate your, your five preferred options in order of relevance, and just you can just post through your chat the number of that topic, and that will help us greatly in uh, being able to um, uh, plan the webinars for 2021. And I want to mention is that the January webinar, which is the last day of January, the last Friday, we're going to do a super webinar, meaning it's a two plus hour webinar where we will have um, also some perspectives through pre-recorded video of some Gießen users from around the world, specifically on how they strategize a, uh, the roasting of a coffee of their choice. And so that super webinar will be um, next month, the end of um, uh, January, 2021. But um, we have seen uh, that there is ongoing interest in these webinars, obviously. And that leads us also into an important topic, marketing, branding, it's basically the key question, you know, you now have done that all that planning into your business. And so now how do you sell your coffee? How do you make all the work that went into equipment selection, green coffee selection and all of that? How do you make that uh, to work for yourself? Um, you might be uh, uh, familiar with a so-called SWOT analysis, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis. And strengths is basically, you know, what are the core capabilities that give you an edge, that give you an advantage um, versus your competition. Your weaknesses, factors that leave you at a disadvantage. Opportunities, those elements that uh, you should exploit because you have um, a, a very specific strengths that you can monetize and then threats, you know, these are factors um, in the um, business environment that could be detrimental. For example, right now we're going through an experience, all of us, COVID, that is to those that have cafe businesses, COVID is a major threat, but those that have 
uh, a well-developed um, website that caters to uh, consumers at home um, that can be an opportunity which can grow into a strength. Doing SWOT analysis in my experience, having done this various times um, with clients and also with our own uh, business helps us always to uh, do a reality check and it helps us navigate the future of our business. Um, so it's really part of setting the, the course of uh, your business model. And that can then lead into unique value propositions or unique selling propositions, UVPs or USPs. And, and so what is um, what are these unique value propositions? They're really unique benefits that you are able to create through planning where multiple aspects, multiple factors um, realign, align with one another. And it could be, for example, could be um, an approach, a technology that you develop or a set of protocols that you develop like unique uh, roasting protocols. It could be around um, the understanding you create about your coffees by uh, always diligently cupping your coffees um, with your staff or even with your clients. Um, it could be a various factors that can make you stand out in the field. Rick, um, have you, um, I know that you, were, you, were, you started your business quite recently, but have you been able to identify some, some of these UVPs for your own model? Yeah, I mean, you know, my my overall sort of business strategy was to um, really um, be old school in a way, you know, like the you know the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. I just really wanted to create uh, a, an opportunity. So one thing I'm I'm doing right now is I'm just online. I'm, I'm, I'm e-commerce set up. I don't have a coffee shop. My future expansion um, will be a, a separate facility. But I think one of the things I wanted to create was a um, coffees. I have very good experience in good manufacturing practice and those regulated environments, quality assurance, quality control programs. You know, I think one thing I do pride myself on is is consistency. Um, I'd say I roast with passion because I, I developed roast profiles that I think, uh, you know, a, a, a very good for the beans I'm offering. Um, I really understand the roast. I really understand. I buy the coffee. I package everyone's coffee. You know, I roast it. And one thing I really like, I think that's uh, unique for me is um, in the market I am in and the location I am is that I get to know my customers. Most customers, even though they're eligible for free shipping because of their order value, they still want to come in and collect. And I just love being part of their routine in their kitchen every day when they're having their coffee. They know who's roasted it. They ask questions about the coffee. I, I have customers, which is really funny because this is the one thing I really like about my business. I have customers that, you know, send me pictures of their, their grinds after the brew. You know, what can I do better? And, you know, it's just help educate and you get to have those personal relationships. Great. And these are essential in, in a coffee roasting business. You know, I, I ask um, clients of ours that come for us for uh, private consultancy, and we do this a lot, actually. Um, I, I recommend you all to um, um, share some of your business questions with us. Marcus and I, we, we like to do these questions just you know, as a service to you, and maybe that then helps you um, uh, decide to engage us for a type of consultancy, um, which comes at a great value, by the way. But if a client, prospective client, tells me uh, when I ask them, "What are your unique selling points or your unique value propositions?" If they tell me, "We have the best coffee, we give people the best service." and we are just the best game in town, then I always give them a um, reality check. I tell them, you know, that's not a unique value proposition because everyone 
tells this, right? And so unique value propositions as Rick indicated have to be more than that. Um, and, and usually it starts with um, asking yourself and doing maybe some a survey, you know, what do your customers really want? What are their preferences? And then looking at the competition, what do some of your competi competitors do well? Which of their products sells the most? Um, what flavor profiles are these products? How does their service model work? Um, and then looking at uh, introspectively, what do you do well as a business? Or what do you strive to do well? And that also comes then into, uh, I would say a more um, key question is the what, how, and why of your business. There's a, um, there's a guru, he's a marketing entrepreneurial guru um, by the name of Simon Sinek. And if you Google his name, um, there's a speech he, he has um, given and it's recorded and it's one of the most watched YouTube videos ever because it's really about ultimately about the why of your business model. And this is key because, you know, Rick is an example. Uh, for him, his coffee business also became part of his lifestyle. Um, and coffee is a lifestyle product, whether you're on the consumer side or on the entrepreneurial side. And so then asking, you know, why do you want to run this business? So what is the purpose? What's the cause? What are your personal beliefs in, in, in all of this is I think very essential. Um, I would want to emphasize also that as part of that why that you should um, project what the role is of your business, your brand in this society. So how can you make this world into a better world, whether it's uh, offering your coffee so that people can just have a, uh, an enjoyment, a moment of relaxation or enjoyment, or maybe the coffee that you roast will uh, help some humanitarian relief efforts, or maybe the coffee that uh, you distribute will benefit um, your suppliers, your coffee farmers through your direct trade model with which you better their lives. It doesn't always have to be um, a, um, uh, an effort that, that is like a philanthropic effort because ultimately we have to pay our bills. But the why of your business model is really key because that ultimately helps you also uh, define even better a unique value proposition from that perspective. Um, and I'm going to pass the baton again to Marcus. But before I do that, I want to emphasize all of you that are listening and watching Please go to your chat box, tell us which topics for future Gießen webinars you'd like to uh, present us. Just give us the numbers of the topics in uh, order of um, uh, importance and that will help us to do the best possible job in the future. Let's talk about uh, marketing, uh, Marcus. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead into the next slide, Willem, because I think, you know, we're talking about all of these unique value propositions and SWOT analysis, and it sounds like therapy almost. But you know, ultimately, this helps to guide your principles for marketing and for your brand. And you know, marketing is really this holistic approach of the product that you're offering at the price point or the tier of price that you're offering it, the place where you're selling it, and then of course any of the, the promotions and the PR and the advertising and things that, that go into your business. So go ahead to the next slide. Anyway, and marketing is really just one part of branding. And you know the idea of brand, it's this entire experience that your customers have with your product or, or your company from their first encounter through every time. And it really is based on research and understanding your customers, what they want, what they need, their attitudes and their experience. Hey, and branding is so much more than just a slogan. Go ahead. And, you know, and here, I think Apple, when you consider this tenant of branding is a good example, right? I think I've, I've 
asked a lot of people, when you get a new iPhone or a new Apple computer, is it hard for you to throw away the box? And the answer to that is almost always yes, because it's this experience, even the packaging that goes into it, even the experience in an Apple store or on support is very different than any other computer company. So, you know, they've really crafted a brand that has these, this very distinct quality to it. Next. And so I want to ask Rick a little bit about his brand. And, you know, this is a, a shot that I just pulled off of, I think the Facebook page, Rick, for your farmer's market. Yeah, <laughs> one of the earlier ones. Yeah, I mean, I actually, um, Burwell Beans, so let me just give you a bit of background there. Burwell Beans is named after a, an Anglo-Saxon town uh, called Burwell in, in Cambridge, in England. Um, that actually uh, means a, um, a Anglo-Saxon fort or settlement close to water, next to water, and it represented new trade, new beginnings, new life, etc. Part of my career, I used to work for a Pfizer in the UK and I moved to Cambridge for a different job. So for me, that was a new beginning. And Burwell always, you know, to me has represented that, that new start in life type of thing. So I thought the name was pretty apt. The, the shape of the fort actually is the, the logo that you see, but ironically, it also matches two Bs back to back, you know, for Burwell beans. Um, also very similar to a butterfly, which, you know, represents new life. I so love it. You've got this whole like picture and story behind it, right? Which is yeah, and then, you know, my whole thing was, you know, the, the way I wanted to operate the business was, you know, give people that new, that new start, that fresh start with every cup of coffee, you know, um, educate people on converting those sort of consumer drinkers into the specialty coffee arena really try to understand the coffee, really understand the flavor profiles that coffees can produce and how complex it is. So, you know, I've had, I've had great feedback on that. One thing as a new business, which is really challenging is the investment to go for like pre-printed bags and stuff to, you know, the minimum orders are, are tens of thousands of dollars. So yeah. I opt to go for a totally compostable bag, which is one of the few bags that even the lining and the valve is actually plant-based and it's, you know, all breaks down naturally. The labels obviously are, are just recyclable. Um, you know, and I put a lot of sort of environmental um, management into the way I operate the business too, even though from my exhaust system and, you know, I, I compost, recycle 98% of my waste. Um, so, you know, the environment was a big part as well, but that overall brand, I had a designer um, come up with a logo for me, which I was very, very pleased with. I think it's you know, yeah. well on from what I was looking at. Sorry if I was great. And I and I think Rick, you know what I what I like though is the way that you described it and the way you've talked about your business throughout. You can go on, Willem, to the next slide. You know, it's not just the logo. It's not just the design. You know, yeah, maybe pre-printed bags would be nice, but that's not the be-all end-all, because you know you've thought a lot about these things. So I think when you're getting started with branding, or I encourage all of you to sit down and think about your brand now and think about how it might resonate with your target audience and who that audience is, right? Your positioning statement, that's coming back to that, uni uni that unique value proposition. Um, and your personality, what's the personality of your brand? And then ultimately, you know, your brand should be memorable. It should, your audience should drive the brand. It should be consistent. It should be prominent. You know, here we have Equator, I'm drinking there interpretation of Finca Sophia this morning. And I think, you know, they're very consistent with colors, with messaging, but it's also very prominent. So, you know, they can produce a billboard like you see on the right that doesn't even have their name on it. But if you've ever come across the brand, you kind of know who they are. And so uh, hopefully this gets you excited to take a look at and analyze your brand as it stands right now and, and think about if there's opportunities or not to improve it. And, you know, and so as a as a closing thought and as a closing comment, I want to, uh, before we say goodbye and wish you a wonderful end of this year, uh, we have a, a holiday, holiday discount here at Booth Coffee Campus. Um, there's a uh, code that's um, giving thanks 2020 that you can use. You can go to uh, bootcoffee.com and to our uh, webinar section, we have a program 
that is very comprehensive. It is amazing. The Marcus has been doing an amazing job designing this. So write this code down, giving thanks 2020. And here you can see the upcoming programs uh, that we, we have. Um, the Roasting Business Fundamentals is actually the full on two day seminar, online seminar, webinar, fo focusing on the topics that we have covered today and much and much more. Um, roast Profiling Workshop on January 11th, scoring with the SCA form, the 19th, and an exciting uh, new webinar, Cupping Together Virtual Tasting, where you actually receive a box with samples and under the professional guidance of Marcus, you, you'll get a really good introduction into uh, sensory evaluation with samples that actually all the participants, including the instructors, are cupping at that same time. And having said that, Rick, is there a closing closing thought that you would want to share with the audience before we say goodbye? I don't know, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, thanks for the invite to participate, but I think, you know, one thing that really resonated with me is, you know, spending a whole career um, in one industry, there is life, you know, you know new beginnings. And I, I, I think that, you know, coffee, um, is such a complex subject and there's so much to learn and you can never stop learning and you know the, the, it, it's a great great career to have so I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it and I would, I would encourage people to to dive in if you know if they're considering it great thank you um one more time please indicate your preferred topics through the chat box and so that we can do uh, the best possible job in the new year. Um, my closing thoughts, uh, this was a crazy year, needless to say, doesn't require any further comments. Next year will still be a challenging year, but things are getting better um, while the um, vaccines will be um, distributed further. But here, from us all, also on behalf of Gießen Coffee Roasters, I want to uh, thank you all for uh, your ongoing um, uh, support, trust in the Gießen brand. Even if you're not roasting with Gießen, we still say thank you for the trust in Gießen because we're all a family of coffee roasters. I want to um, thank um, the folks of Gießen in the Netherlands, uh, Wilfred, Mark, Davy and the entire staff. I want to thank uh, David and Katie, um, who are uh, David Sutfin, the Gießen representative in, representatives in North America. Um, and I want to um, thank you all. Rick, thanks for investing the time. Marcus, great job today. Um, this was a, a fun webinar. We will be able to um, share this webinar, the recording uh, with you all. Um, and um, I know that there are some questions that um, came in through the chat and we will, um, uh, because of time restrictions, we will answer those at the best of our abilities and hopefully see you soon in the new year and good luck, great health, prosperity and happiness. That's the best we can uh, wish you. And uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Marcus. Thank Thanks. you, Rick. Thanks, everyone.